what I'm talking about. to the session that I want to host here, which is uh, running for the next hour. And uh, this will be two parts. The first part will be an introduction of myself, like not about myself, but about the topic with a few slides. Um, and then I would like to engage with you. So I would like to have you in a vivid discussion. We can use the chat. We are, you're very welcome to use just uh, to unmute yourself then and um, to uh, basically talk and uh, have let's have a discussion about the topic of resilience um, and how we increase resilience, how we make our organizations, but I also want to go beyond organizations. I'm clearly working a lot with organizational companies, but this is really for resilience in all our systems, be it communities, be it organizations, be it society um, at large, like nation states, we need this kind of concept. We need to comprehend it and we need to integrate it into the way we design our systems because clearly what we're experiencing right now um, is not a result of mostly resilient organizations. So we have a pretty much total breakdown, a collapse, near collapse anyways, and um, we could deal better with such situations. We cannot prevent them, but we can deal better and we can make our organizations, our communities uh, future ready for this. And this is the topic of today. Now, um, just to give like, uh, many of you don't know me, just to give a, like, a little bit of introduction about myself. My name is Arndt, I'm based in Berlin, and um, my background is actually in biochemistry, biotechnology, and neuroscience. I did my PhD about how we learn, um, the mechanisms of how our brain is wired and how we learn and how memory works. And I love that because I love the complexity of the brain. I, I think it's one of the most amazing and beautiful like systems we, we are working on and we're exploring. Um, yet, I didn't want to get stuck in academia for various reasons. One being that I really wanted to have a larger impact than just publishing papers. So then I moved on and thought, okay, the brain is an amazing complex adaptive system and we can abstract a lot of learnings into how we run organizations, how we, how we can take advantage of the knowledge we have about the brain to uh, basically increase human prosperity and like um, like just improve the living conditions and create a better world. But um, I also realized, well, there's more out there. And with my biological background, I then explored a topic that's called biomimicry. I learned with Janine Benyus in the US uh, Biomimicry um, Institute, uh, how we can look into biological systems and really complex adaptive systems what we can abstract there and bring into human problem solving for two reasons, because the strategies are amazing in terms of what we can learn. And if we look at the language we use in business nowadays, I mean, this is mostly biology. Uh, we talk about resilience, about adaptation. We talk about ecosystems. We talk about self-organization. Uh, all these things are really clearly based in biology, but also in terms of how systems and systems value is generated because it's not just about profit maximization and it shouldn't be at all just that uh, but it's really about what is the bigger value we create how does it fit in how do we create ecosystems and thinking systems that work coherently and are resilient um, that consequently led me then also of course to the human nature of design so how do we design for people and with people um, uh, to design thinking and other agile approaches, which I uh, use a lot also in, in company organizations um, and helping them with their transition. And I connect this with an amazing community as well, again, um, with uh, the ecosystem uh, around exponential organizations started by Sal and Ismail, um, where we look into what can we learn from these fastest growing organizations in terms of um, the mechanisms, the attributes, um, the behaviors, uh, how they scale and how they use an entirely new mindset, which is based on abundance. I'll go into this as well. Um, so these need to be brought together. And this is what I want to talk about because we have already entered and for everybody who hasn't believed or realized that before latest with uh, the, the coronavirus, everybody now realized we're living in, an, uh, in a world where this kind of metaphor of the machine doesn't hold any longer. So we're uh, like everything we do because we are biological beings and as our communities we behave in a in a complex way uh, we have to use the metaphor of a living system of a living organization um, and that requires a fundamental rethink of the way we run we operate these systems and we anticipate the future 
Um, now, since this is most like this design thinking camp has a lot to do with agile methods with design thinking, I wanted to start with something that I see a lot and hear a lot, and which I sometimes say also, which because it's true, um, but you, and you can replace this by the star agile by anything else. It's a mindset, and uh, like it's uh, agile is a mindset, and resilience is a mindset, and all these things. It's always a mindset, and that is true. But um, it's also dangerous to just focus on mindset change um, because that alone will not change the world. It's necessary but not sufficient because it's not actionable so we need both we need the mindset and, a, and an urgency and an understanding and comprehension of a need and a different mindset um, but something that dave snowden said and he's like pretty famous for complexity science he's the creator of the um, kinevin framework uh, most of you are probably aware of um, so he said mindset seems to be replacing values and mission as the latest action avoiding latitude so like let's not basically inflate all these concepts they are important but let's go beyond and that is something i want to uh, create more depth today and also in our conversation to spark a discussion around these things um because uh, when we look at an organization um that we want to where we want to increase the um resilience and uh, the question is also why do they want to be resilient why do they want to be agile it's not a means like uh, it's a means to an end and not a means by itself uh, or an end by itself um, it's not only it's the mindset and this is the first thing usually you often start with um, but you need to empower people to be capable of doing something else you need a skill set as well and what you also need is a tool set so you need different processes different approaches and they need to go hand in hand without doing that in a coherent manner you cannot change culture because culture is an emergent thing and just the mindset alone will never work because it's not actionable and it will also lead especially under pressure and that's what happens in moments of crisis it will fall back into old patterns and behaviors so you need a clear skill set people need to be capable of doing things and a tool set that they can apply on the other side many organizations and also our leaders across the board be it organizations be it our nation state leaders and polit like politicians they need support and whoever supports them be it coaches like us I guess many of you are kind of coaches, uh, myself too, or I call it catalysts because coach is also, again, a very inflated concept. And the, it's not about just teaching someone and telling or consulting and advising um, because we as coaches don't necessarily should have and can even possibly have all answers, but we are more a guidance, like a catalyst to spark a change and then go out of the system again and enable them to do it without us. And there's, again, two, uh, like there are four parts required and i see this way too little because again there's a huge or has been before crisis a huge burst of coached offerings but a few of them are really capable of really helping to change because the first thing is the attitude um how do i go in into an organization or like a, like a community to change um do i go in to sell as many sprints as possible or as many workshops or trainings as possible for the sake of again maximizing my own revenue uh, just to do the sprint or because i love a method so much and i'm an evangelist of my best method or do i go in in order to see what is needed and with an attitude of empowerment and helping these people to do it without me afterwards that's a totally different mindset that's required. It's fundamentally required to change an organization. The second thing then is experience. Um, if I'm a novice, of course I need to get started somewhere, but without having a mentor, without going into an organization, being there the first time, I can't possibly have experience. And experience is necessary for referencing back to things because many things are run by intuition and heuristics because we are dealing with uncertainty. And I come to this a little bit later. And if we go in just with uh, textbook knowledge or even like some theoretical education, we will impossibly be able to comprehend the complexity of organizations. So experience is the second thing that's required. The third thing to build uh, resilience in organizations and help them to become resilient is competence. Uh, with competence, I mean fluency in terms of dealing with people, empathy, understanding needs, a fluency in connecting methods and uh, knowing what to do when. Again, that relates strongly to experience, but also that's something where I seamlessly connect them to make it comprehensive and comprehensible to the people. And the final thing is expertise. Um, I need to know the fundamentals and I can't be just shallow. I need to have some backing of why I do it. I need to do some basic science behind it and some concepts that I'm talking about and not just because it was uh, written somewhere in an article. So if you just have, if you don't have the left to the attitude and the competence, you will never make it stick. And if you don't have the two on the right side experience or expertise, 
you don't actually know what you're talking about. And that is fundamental to helping organizations and you want to build this within organizations. Um, and you want to empower people to reach this level. And that then relates to the science of change actually, because change requires basically three parts. It's the motivation and the urgency. It's the fundamental understanding that is connected to mindset, but also to triggers in the environment. Something happens, I relate it to myself. That's why it should not be only cognitively anchored, but also emotionally anchored. That's why, and I come to this, we need very strong stories to motivate people to go in the same direction. Second thing is capability. So they need to have the ability, the capability to do things differently without that. I mean, as much as they want, they cannot move anything. And finally, the opportunity. I need to provide opportunities for them to apply their skills. Unless this happens, I cannot have behavioral change on a societal level, on an organizational level, and so on. So this is this all was the basis for me over the years to develop a concept um, that I call hybrid thinking. Um, because the 21st century is the century of blurring boundaries, of breaking down silos. And it's not about as much as I may love one or the other method, everybody who says he's an evangelist of one method, I'm already skeptical because there is no such thing like one method that does it all. There is no silver bullet. You always need to connect things. We always need to connect people and mindsets and cultures and diversity. So it's always about diversity because there's a, a concept that's called um, Ashby's law, which says if I have a complex system, a complex problem, I can only solve it if I have an equally or even more complex solution system. Um, so this is the law of the requisite variety. And therefore we need diversity in order to tackle problems of the 21st century. We need a lot of people uh, of different backgrounds, of different expertise, of different approaches. So um, the hyper thinking concept is based on uh, the, the uh, thing that and connects to what people know, uh, the VUCA concept, which is an acronym most of you probably know. I just introduced it for those maybe who don't. Uh, the VUCA is an acronym for volatility. So the speed by which everything changes constantly, which creates uncertainty um, because not knowing what happens tomorrow or in a month or a year down the road creates definitely uncertainty. Uh, it's in increasing complexity because there's more and more data and more and more interconnectedness uh, emerging. And finally, ambiguity, which means um, I can't know it all and I have to take decisions based on a limited data or knowledge set because it's impossible to know everything. I will always have blind spots. Um, and this is very often perceived as a threat but it can be turned into an opportunity. And that's something that hybrid thinking does. And I'll give you now step-by-step step, um, the approaches that relate to resilience, um, how this concept uh, relates to this VUCA world. The first is using the same, uh, again, the same first letters is if everything is volatile, um, you want to have a vision, your organization, your country, whoever it is, your party, your community, the first thing you need to have is a vision, a transformative purpose. Why is that important? Um, it is very important because without a vision, you don't have a goal. You don't connect people. And the vision must be something that is purpose-driven, that is transformative, that is radical. Salem Ismail calls it the massive transformative purpose. Um, uh, Simon Sinek calls it the why. Whatever you call it, it doesn't matter. It's something that is the fundamental objective to create value, to have a purpose that justifies your existence and that connects people uh, on, a, on a cognitive and emotional level. Um, and what we have uh, here is basically um, uh, the second order thinking, I, this is the ambiguity thinking, um, which requires systems thinking basically. Um, because um, everybody can come up with um, the idea of uh, what can I do immediately now to solve a problem. There's a challenge, there's a question, there's a problem, everybody can immediately find quick ways. Uh, if I'm hungry, everybody will come up with the idea, oh, let's have a piece of chocolate. Um, that's first order thinking, very direct. The second order thinking is, and what's next? And the answer to what's next will definitely be diverse and creative. So obviously, if I eat chocolate every time I feel hungry, that's a bad idea because I know what's next, the consequences are not very healthy. Um, but uh, second order thinking means, okay, maybe I have to think what is the next stage in that. Um, and therefore, um, the um, uh, basically the, the way we have to connect the vision means we have to base it on systems thinking because uh, we have to see interconnections, we have to see consequences of action and what we want to impact, what is the desired state of a world we want to achieve. 
And that is something which is so powerful because it transforms mindset. And this is where we are at mindset. It touches people and it allows us to calibrate everything we do towards a big goal. I'll give an example later in the talk um, to, to show you how powerful such visions can be. Um, the second uh, part of the uncertainty is tackled by mindset innovation. I call it upskilling. Um, why is that important? And here the ambiguity thinking comes in. Uh, whereas in the first part, you need the systems thinking to basically connect these things here. It's about the individual because um, the, uh, we have been conditioned and I call it conditioning because education is not really education empowerment right now. It's coming from a military uh, style organized system still, which was good for 150 years. Um, but uh, right now we need a big revamp of education and we need to empower individuals to live up to their fullest potential on a cognitive level, on an emotional level, on an interpersonal level, all these things, uh, what Peter Spiegel also calls the WeQ skills, um, something we're working on to basically raise that and encourage this in people and build it. Um, and that requires ambiguity thinking. What do I mean by this? Um, the 20th century has been heavily based on measuring intelligence. We have even developed standards and formats, the intelligence quotient, to measure and give a number how intelligent people are and again to compare people. Comparison very often leads to competition or to what is better um, and that's not really necessary because first of all intelligence is such a complex and intangible thing you can't really measure it um, and it creates another problem because if I only rely on something I can measure in terms of uh, analytics and, and these kind of things and language and data and, and active thinking, that's residing in the system too, in the cortical areas, and especially when it comes to planning for prefrontal uh, cortex. And this is how we try to, again, categorize and plan the world, a behavior that was pretty good and made us very successful in the past, and assess risks. The concept of risks is something uh, that only works if uh, I know the rules of the game and if I kind of can assess the probabilities and know probabilities and then based on that I can assess the risk. In an uncertain, in a VUCA world, I cannot assess risks. So what happens here, I need to engage system one. System one is the much older system. It's the limbic system and contains a lot of subsystems. And this is where risk thinking and like thinking about and assessing risks will fail because I cannot know the probability of things that may happen to a large degree. So so-called black swan events, how um, Nassim Taleb calls it, are things that suddenly and surprisingly and disruptively come. They are not foreseeable. They can only be put into context retrospectively and they have a huge impact on systems. Um, and this is something that is requires a different way of approaching these things. And this requires to deal, be comfortable with, and develop methods for ambiguity. Um, where we use, and that is important, more our intuition. It cannot just be rational. Of course, we need to use data uh, and data analytics, but very often data are both incomplete and too late to take a decision. So for quick decision-making intuition, despite the fact that there are cognitive biases, I mean, not saying that it's always perfect, but generally, and there's a lot of literature about it, there's a famous also um, German psychologist, even here from Berlin, Eget Digerinze, who promotes the concept of taking, going from gut feeling, especially for fast paced decisions, uh, is the best thing we have because we have no alternatives. So using heuristics and intuition is a good thing to do, um, to be resilient, to react quickly, especially in times of crisis. Um, the third aspect then goes to the uh, complexity uh, aspect. It's collaboration. Nobody of us will know all answers. Um, and it's better to actually also go for the right questions. It's way more important nowadays and then define answers collectively. So collaboration helps us to find appropriate answers at least for certain times and then evolve them. And that's why I call this hypothesis thinking, um, because nothing we come up with, no matter how good the answer, the solution, whatever it is, will be forever because we have constantly changing conditions and environments. So if this is the case, everything is based on certain hypotheses and assumptions, and we need to test these in order to move forward. Um, and in order to move forward into the, uh, in, in two ways. The first is, is it still relevant and does it work? So is what I'm going to develop before I invest much, is it something worth investing in mentally, time-wise, of course, financially too? Um, or is that wrong assumption uh, or hypothesis? Um, and then I need to pivot because otherwise it doesn't make sense. Also, I need to constantly revalidate things I take for granted because things change. 
Um, and that is fundamental. And that is very difficult, actually impossible to do alone. And that's where we need this kind of collective mindset, what again, Peter Spiegel coined as WeQ instead of IQ. Um, because this collective intelligence is like an organism or like a cell where you have different sensors everywhere. And each of them can sense information at their location, relay it back to some communication center, and then collectively make sense. So we are much faster, we are much more capable and diverse, and that allows us to iterate faster, to sense faster, but also to create more creatively. And that is a very powerful thing for organizations to become resilient, um, which goes together then with this experimental mindset, as I said, and the reinvent attitude. So never take anything we do for granted, always challenge basic assumptions and everything we do. Um, and that is the only thing we can do to stay relevant and to be resilient. Um, because as soon as we feel comfortable in what we do and think, oh, we, we have it all, um, that's the point when we get rigid and don't move. And the slightest change in an environment, which will happen, it's not preventable at all, it will basically kick us off the, um, off the stage. And the final part I want to dive in here is the fourth aspect of uh, the VUCA concept, that's ambiguity. And here it's about future business. How do we build organizations based on these concepts, based on ambiguity that we can't know it all and still have to take decisions? And what we need here is um, exponential thinking. Um, I just see um, here some, sorry. Uh, everybody is on mute now. Okay. Um, so what we see here is that uh, in terms of future organizations, we need to embrace an entire new uh, mindset about exponential thinking. What do I mean by this? Um, right now, all or most of our organizations are based on the concept of scarcity. So the old business dynamics and business schools, uh, even today, actually, business schools tell us that you have a market when you have scarcity. If you don't have scarcity, you create scarcity artificially to create and maintain your market. Um, and that is an old model. But um, in the new world, where we are basically uh, developing technologies that make things abundant and available, this scarcity model doesn't work. Plus, scarcity creates all the negative side effects that we are realizing right now because it has, you basically have uh, like climate um, effects, you have people on, like you have basically a, um, a huge gap between uh, people, uh, living standards and uh, those who win and those who lose. Uh, in an abundance world, it's not about how can I be faster and better than the other person because I tap the few resources I have, but I tap into an abundance of available resources um, and I can leverage on that. That requires an entire new mindset. And that is, by the way, how biological systems work because um, the key concept of information in nature is DNA. And that is equal for everyone and it's abundant. Um, the key resource that all life lives on is oxygen. It's not limited, well, it is limited, life is adapted to it. There is a certain concentration, but that is abundant. Nobody owns that oxygen. And the concept of ownership that we have is just something we humans have and creating scarcity and creating artificial value. And that is one of the biggest problems we see right now. And with this kind of exponential thinking that exponential organizations actually are good at embracing and leveraging is an entire new way of looking in how, into how we organize our world that is exponential. Um, and we all live it now with, uh, with the COVID-19 um, because um, here uh, we see the dynamics of exponential growth and we cannot even anticipate nor even react to it in an appropriate way because it, it quickly moves out of hands. Um, but there are mechanisms and ways to leverage that. Um, and exponential organizations, like the latest organizations that are like less than 20 years old, um, these are organizations that can do this because they leverage communities. They have this big massive transformative purpose that I was talking about before that connects people. They leverage assets without owning them um, so they can scale. Um, they have mechanisms of engaging people, but also they have internal mechanisms to uh, basically manage that abundance. And if we look at many of the business models that are successful, these are things um, that, based, that are based on abundance and not scarcity, like education, for instance, um, that has been an elite thing for many years and decades, only the, the richest people could afford the really best education in some of the countries, at least in the world. Um, in the more social countries that was always supported. But if we look in the US, for instance, um, there it largely depends how much 
you can afford, what kind of uh, education you can get. Um, but with the rise of exponential technologies and information age, this became abundant. Everybody now through MOOCs can download information freely from the best lecturers and professors in the world. Um, Spotify is a model which made music and listening to music abundant before there was a music industry that tried to make artificial scars um, by printing uh, CDs or whatever formats you want, which bind resources, which is insane in, in the first place, by make, moving it into the exponential technology realm, so making it like digitalize it. Um, or digitize it and making a digital uh, digital based model out of it, you move it into an abundant world. It becomes, uh, you dematerialize um, it, so there's no CDs, um, you basically stream it. Um, you demonetize it, so it becomes uh, almost for free, like you get all the music in the world, almost, and um, you don't have to pay a lot, um, and to democratize it, so more and more people can have access to all that music. So that radically changes uh, the way you do business and that is super relevant the way how you basically plan for the future so this abundance and purpose-driven mindset these are the two things that go together um, are fundamental to creating successful and future-proof organizations let me give you an example here um, Elon Musk is notoriously good at doing these things um, and you may not agree with all the things I also have some uh, questions or some hesitations about arguing that all the things are good um, um, but um, definitely he has pushed industries and disrupted industries over and over again with a very amazing and, and brilliant mindset and Tesla is just one of the examples and we all know Tesla builds cars but the vision of Tesla is not to build cars his vision or massive transformed purpose is really accelerating the world's transition to renewable energy so it is the impact he wants to have this organization wants to have and he happens to build cars because that is a means to achieve that end if there's something else he could do to move the world to more renewable energy he would do that too and he connects these things and it's based on abundance so it's based on solar power which is abundant and not fossil fuels that are scarce so this abundance thinking is something that is radically transforming organizations and business models at the same time it's radically more powerful to move to a future that we all want which is not based on basically extraction and exploitation but on community on trust and all these features that bring people together and don't separate them um, so another thing you need um, in a, basically an organization of the 21st century in a fast changing environment and especially when a crisis hits you need contextual awareness um, and that's again where of course you connect it uh, to uh, the, uh, the framework that Dave Snowden has developed for instance that's one great way of looking at it the um, Kinevin framework knowing where you are am I in a context where I am really already in the crisis that requires a totally different leadership style than if I'm in an environment where I know everything I have done it a million of times and I can use a standard these are two opposite ends of a scale um, and knowing where I am and adjusting my leadership style, my decision making and my processes that I apply is fundamental to running a successful organization that can deal with the situation it finds itself in. And then you want to build for resilience um, and you want to use mechanisms that allow you to cope with the crisis. And there again, it matters if you come from the mindset of being in a control and command environment where you think you know it all, and um, then you uh, can basically um, radically fail in the crisis because then you didn't expect anything and you don't have any backup mechanism, or you come from a world of complexity thinking where, of course, it's still a shock, but you can recover much more quickly and maybe you already have redundancy mechanisms or adaptation mechanisms in place that help you to quickly bounce into a like into a point where from where you can act and uh, recover or develop new things so what is resilience about and i know that katrin i'm not sure it's too much for me not to to observe all the people coming in maybe katrin is here already in the call she has been giving a talk earlier today which i couldn't attend um because i was uh playing uh with my kid but um uh, she gave a talk about resilience earlier and was talking about anti-fragility and um, she certainly mentioned some of the parts that I think there's also some overlap here but um, uh, the first aspect of resilience is and this is more coming from an engineering point of view of, or definition of resilience is robustness robustness is something uh, how much can a system withstand pressure and that is what and that only is what 20th century organizations were built for 
Um, that's a good thing to do to, to some extent. Of course, you want to be also robust within a certain margin. Um, but clearly that will fail catastrophically if something happens that is stronger than the robustness you have built. So the second level or the second aspect of this is adaptation. So to have mechanisms within the organization that allow you to self-regulate within or with the things you have in place. So you have already put some redundancy mechanisms uh, in place that allow you to uh, basically help recover faster or pivot to something else, um, to self-regulate in the system, communication strategies and so on. So it allows you to adapt to the new situation. Um, again, that alone is not enough because um, there's new things. You cannot have prepared everything for a or any possible crisis because otherwise it wouldn't be a crisis by definition. So then the next thing is what you need as part of resilience is transformation. And that uh, evolves um, learning and change. Um, so you want to really absorb and sense what's happening, what's different. How can I deal with that change? And how can I use and leverage this change as a, le as a learning opportunity in order to integrate new things into my system? So it's not only using and self-regulating the systems I have in place, but adding or or changing existing ones in order to create something that is better in coping with the situation at hand. And finally, and that is something that comes uh, from biology, biological systems are great at this, um, and that is something that also Nassim Taleb mentions in his anti-fragility concept, is something we call acceptation or pre-adaptation. So you constantly, and that's why you need this experimentation mindset again, and constantly hypothesis-based testing, uh, you want to develop things that may at a given uh, time point not be of relevance, but put you in a better position in the future because they are just right in that condition. You don't know that yet though. So you always want to develop things and disrupt yourself for possible things in the future because they may come. That also means they are not highly efficient because they may also not be relevant in the future, but not having them may delay your response or your uh, adaptation mechanisms. So putting all this together creates the concept of resilience. And you always want to think, how strong do I need to be in order to withstand certain pressure? How much do I want to leverage the existing mechanisms and features I have in my organization to integrate them in a wise way and to reshuffle them if something changes? How much need do I need or am I able to transform in order to integrate learnings and create something new? And how much can I pre-adapt um, in order to potentially adapt or pre-adapt or create something that could create an advantage in a possible crisis. So these are the things um, that I wanted to share and give us a starting point uh, for this discussion that we can have now for the next 20 minutes. Um, this is what I call hybrid thinking because it's really bringing different aspects together. It's connecting all the parts of our brain. It's connecting different people, different backgrounds, different methods. So there is no such thing like this is the perfect approach, um, but it all belongs together and it is depending on situation and context. I hope um, I inspired, I hope this also sparked some new thoughts, uh, maybe provoked some questions and I'm very happy to share those now. So I will now give you permission and that's why I was a bit confused earlier in this talk. Um, uh, somebody posted there is background noise, which shouldn't happen because everybody should be uh, muted by default. What I'll do now, I will allow you to unmute yourself. Um, and I would like to ask you for the discipline to unmute yourself when you want to say something. Um, and maybe you can even use uh, the hand up sign, uh, which appears then in my list and um, mute yourself again after you have talked that we don't get background noises so that it stays a pleasant experience for everyone. Um, so I think everybody should be capable of uh, unmuting themselves. And um, yeah, I would like to open up the, uh, it's now for a discussion and would like to hear your reflections, questions you may have, opinions you have. So let's get into a vivid discussion. Thank you first of all for listening and uh, being part of this conversation and let's make it uh, conversational here. Yes. Uh, hi, Ernst, it's Sarah McInerney. Ah, hi, Sarah. Oh, <laughs> awesome. Absolutely, absolutely amazing, amazing talk. But I wanted to ask um, something that I'm seeing with the business that I'm in right now is that prior to this whole COVID-19, they were all about moving forward and innovation and thinking outside the box. But since this has hit, everything has just stopped from an innovation platform. And they seem to, and apparently this is what this company does. They've reverted back to 
well, we do this really, really well. So we're just going to focus on this and block everything else out. Right, right. So after this whole COVID-19 issue and moving into the, the next steps, how do, you, how do you instill that importance of moving forward and future-based thinking? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, this response that you described is a very natural response that we see not only in co uh, companies, we see it basically globally right now. Uh, this kind of crazy lockdown of everything and like a shutdown to zero pretty much is a behavior uh, uh, triggered by fear, by uncertainty and by um, the incapability of basically having experienced that to this extent before and not knowing how to deal with it. And this is a behavior that is really a very um, like archaic, if I, if I may say. Uh, it's really going back, like we go back to really things we, we know because we have this, if we're uncertain and it creates this uh, like unpleasant feeling and almost sometimes fear, uh, we rather try to do things and get control about the situation. And what gives us control? We do things we know um, or we, we think we know, um, to give us the, at least the, like the, the uh, belief or uh, experience of control, which we in fact don't have. Um, so they fall back. So that's a clear indicator that this is not a resilient organization because they don't embrace that as an opportunity, but rather go into survival mode. Now, um, in that mode, it's very difficult to move them um, because right now they're just struggling to survive probably. Um, they have to see how they deal with not laying off people or how they work with shorter times, how they even make virtual work uh, possible, how they deal with like basically maybe zero revenue and still costs, running costs, all these things that are catastrophic for some businesses. And um, honestly, there will be many organizations that will also fail and not survive. Also, that is a very sad reality. Um, but in that mode, it is very difficult. What we can help here is to see how can we leverage this situation as an opportunity. So not to say you need to be innovative and think outside the box and don't be ang like don't be uh, anxious or like fearful because it's not about oh I, I'm just not and then I just switch but it's about understanding them again empathy and then trying to see how can we cope and how can we reframe the situation in terms of looking at, at this as an opportunity. Um, an example for this is in 2000 and oh no was it 2008 I believe when the SARS crisis was. Um, I believe it was 2008. Um, Alibaba, for instance, um, was also um, like in a crisis, like the, the SARS crisis, especially in China, as we know. And in that year, they developed um, an entire new um, um, e-commerce platform um, that became the biggest in the world, the eighth most clicked website in the world, I believe. And that was during that crisis. So they leveraged this as an opportunity while still there were uh, problems with the running business model. Uh, it was 2002 or 2003, sorry, that's right. Um, so um, uh, that is something uh, that requires boldness, that requires courage. Again, these are the values underlying also the agile mindset. If you look at this, you need to take bold decisions. You need to be brave and courageous. Uh, take risks in an uncertain world and just do it and work with hypotheses. So quickly move. Uh, it doesn't help to be in a like a, in a survival mode like an animal to to not move and just try close your eyes like a kid and say okay it will go over and it will be over soon and then i'll just continue but you have to move and you have to do something it's like we call it like uh, it also comes from uh like basically complex systems thinking uh alice um in the wonder world right uh, we know this red queen uh thing the red queen effect that's what it's called in systems thinking um in in a world where everything changes it's um you can't stand still. It's, it's not um, basically you can't wait. You have to constantly run. You have to constantly move um, because otherwise you, you can't make it. And that is true also when there's no crisis. You constantly have to disrupt yourself. You constantly have to think about how to reframe, how to challenge, how to do the next thing and how to pre-adapt. So I hope that helps. So empathy, uh, connecting to them and trying to reframe in, in, in the brevity. Um, then there were a few questions. Yes, uh, sociocracy, um, definitely part of hybrid thinking, of course. And like these are all different name tags, like they have from Frederick Lalu, the reinventing organizations, they're all based on these kind of concepts. And whatever you name it, that's why I try to dissolve, like it doesn't matter, for me, it doesn't matter what the concept is named because what is important are the values and the mechanisms behind. So it's all based on humans. It's basically humanization of workplace, humanization of the world, democratization, building trust, um, building on capabilities for empowering people to do good stuff. And, um, and that requires certain methods and certain approaches. And whether you call this so, so, uh, sociocracy or reinventing organizations or agile, whatever this is, for me, that doesn't matter. Um, and I think we need to 
leave behind these concepts because again they build walls uh, if i say oh i'm doing design thinking but that's better than this or i do i don't know agile and that's better than a waterfall again that's it's wrong to say because there are conditions where waterfall is just the right thing and agile is just stupid and and uh, not the right thing to do um so we need to be embracing this diversity yes Jim. um i just wanted to add to that because um i'm also very uh I come from the arts. I work creatively for 20 years and the basic or the essence methods we explore already for so many years, interdisciplinarity mm -hmm. to elaborate new ideas. And of course, the, the goal is another one to do a piece of art at the end of the day, but the methods and the, the working processes are very similar. Mm -hmm. And I feel at the moment, um, because I'm also dealing with these agile worlds and these methods a lot, the next level for me is really that it's not so much to dissolve the boundaries. You know, we give these methods names, mm -hmm. but what is the essence of it? And can we not lose more time in saying it's this or it's that? Correct. Yeah. yeah so it's a little bit a comment and a yeah, finding yeah. for myself within it all. Right. And especially a very good point. Um, and especially the problem is also if you use certain names very often, they have been inflated already. I mean, regardless what you use, if you use agile or design thinking, most people don't say, oh, yay, let's do it. But many people also say, oh, no, go away with that. It's just best buzzword. And it's not about buzzwords. It's about what's behind. And it doesn't necessarily need a name. It needs a deep understanding, uh, conviction, and also a capability of bringing this across and make it relevant that's important because it's all based on certain values and approaches but not just copying a tool but copying the principle and applying more uh, even the principle to this organization to the context you are in and that makes it relevant because only if it's made relevant and tangible does it create value and that is very often missing also and which is really um, using it on a very high and superficial level without creating uh, like value so I see, yeah, thanks for those people uh, listing the books because it's very hard for me to read, answer and, and type. So yeah, um, the books are already listed here, great. Any other questions? There's a question here in the chat that I pick up in the meantime, unless I always prefer um, actually conversation. So just unmute yourself and uh, feel free to talk. Um, but in the meanwhile, until somebody does so, there's a question how much, uh, when you work with clients, how much time is spent on establishing a purpose-driven mindset? Um, well, uh, it's it's not done overnight for sure it's like very often i work with projects uh, for more than a year uh, that doesn't mean that the, the purpose driven mindset is never taking so long but to to basically build the fundamentals and to make it uh, viable over time and to create some traction some fluency also for them to work with it and to not only have it in a team because it's rather fast to do that in a team but a team will be quickly frustrated if it hits the boundary uh, outside the borders and boundaries of its team so you need to define also how do i uh, radiate and how do i communicate these uh, values or this mindset and the processes i've created to the outside how do i cope with this kind of systems boundary because Clearly, I mean, I cannot change an entire corporate, but I can work with a division or a department. But that department needs also to, and then again, this is system thinking, you need to identify what are the interactions it has with other stakeholders outside the department, and how do I deal with the situations? What artifacts do I create in order to ease that contact to not frustrate them? And that requires some time until they get some uh, basically uh, fluency and also some experience in that, because if they are not experienced enough or not fluent enough the problem is they go into what just sarah mentioned into this kind of shock behavior and they fall back into their old behaviors and definitely don't want that uh where can we find the recording of my talk um let's see i'll, I'll probably post it somewhere um i, I haven't uh, maybe it's somewhere on youtube or i will make it public for sure i'll cut out the like a few things from the beginning it started with earlier to make it nice and crisp but uh, i'll put it online uh, that you can follow up and then uh, just follow me on linkedin um i'll put it i put the post uh, to announce this talk on linkedin and i'll put it into the comment there or even a new post so if you uh, follow me on linkedin you will uh, become aware of it <clears throat> anything else alistair you unmuted yourself it's so awesome to see you here again i cannot hear you are you saying something or is, is it me or is it Can someone who, like just in the chat, can, Alistair, are you saying something? Can you maybe type a yes in the chat? Because I do not hear you right now. I'm again, not sure. 
Okay, can somebody else say if you hear Alistair? Cannot hear him. Okay, nobody can hear you. Um, you're not unmuted. Maybe again, there's something. Again, what helped me was going into the settings of Zoom and adjusting. The, yes, now I can hear you. Awesome. Can you hear me now? Yes, fantastic. I can. Fantastic. I have a very practical question. Uh -huh. um, engaging leadership in business that's going through all of this turmoil and change. There, so the concept of abundance and exponential organizations is a bit of a shock to the system to them. Um, how would you introduce the first baby steps of biomimicry at the intersection of um, exponential organizations and abundance? Uh, mm -hmm. So for me, this is personally very, very interesting to okay. introduce. Yeah. And it feels and like you can maybe overcomplicate it, but what's the simple answer? Right. Uh, well, there is not a simple answer, but I try to make it brief because we have a limited time, but I'm also happy to connect with you, Alistair, afterwards, like, at a different time to go more into depth. Um, the thing is, the entry point is um, that now there is more awareness about different, the, for the need of a different approach. That's the first thing. So it helps. The door is a little bit more open than it was before. Before, I, honestly, I was sneaking in uh, and it was infusing this concept through the back door um, uh, because they were more concerned about agility and all these kind of things. Well, yeah. um, if you look at, uh, and I mentioned it earlier, all the concepts we're talking about, like resilience, um, self-organization, network of uh, decentralization, they are all biological terms. So these are things that people understand that they cannot come from the old world because they do not know how to do it. And mm. then I work with, and again, there it helps um, to be a biologist clearly. Um, uh, but uh, again, we also work with biologists if we do these things, uh, if, we, if we create innovations or like also systems change. Um, to understand how do certain mechanisms, uh, certain, certain organisms or certain systems in biology deal with certain things and which um, strategies or mechanisms do they use in order to, uh, to have a certain effect. And we use these as cases to explain how that works and translate it basically to their understanding in a non-biological world, how this relates to the organization. And mm -hmm. this is very, very powerful because they mm -hmm. see at the problem through a different lens they have this aha moment and then they want to know how this works. And then again, you'd need these approaches that I was talking about, the systems thinking, the complexity mindset, the abundance mindset to make that work. And then you trigger, uh, sometimes this is a little bit triggering the immune system, Alistair, that we know uh, what we're talking about, this, this corporate immune system. And they get that again, it's a biological metaphor, right? We're talking about the defense mechanism that we call the immune system um, that basically tries to keep to the old business model. And these things are so powerful and trigger um, uh, certain behaviors, either uh, wanting to know more or sometimes challenging, challenging this, but their arguments do not hold um, this, the new requirements. So they quickly also get into this uh, understanding. Yes, we actually need to learn more about that because we cannot deal with that in the old way. And this is usually how we enter, but definitely we can uh, talk about this. If this is interesting for you uh, in a separate chat, or let's, let's just reconnect. Anyways, it's yeah. great to talk because Perfect. we have seen us. Uh, Alistair and myself, we are both uh, part of this uh, exponential organizations ecosystem. And um, uh, he has also shared great, amazing ideas uh, two weeks ago at the Exo World, which was really cool. Um, Anybody interested in connecting? Yes, I see. Post your LinkedIn profiles here if you want to connect. You can find me under my name, very easy, if you want to learn more or follow. Um, I want to be also appreciative to your time because I know there are other talks uh, and, and uh, topics coming up. I thank you very much for your uh, interaction here, for your questions. Uh, for I, I see that you enjoyed it. I love that and I really want to create a better world together with you. I love this community. Thank you a lot and have a great Sunday, everyone everywhere in the world. See you around and stay in touch. Bye-bye. Ciao.